Sure, so, so this concept of pulmonary embolism response teams or PERT uh, is about, oh, maybe eight or nine years old uh, now. It started Mass General Hospital. And the idea was to kind of get multidisciplinary groups together to make decisions about treating PE. So a lot of what, what was done with PE response teams, at least initially, was with you know, larger, scarier pulmonary emboli that people were worried about. Do you, do you give them thrombolytic therapy? Do you try to suction the clot out or, or break it up? Or what do you do here? Or do you just anticoagulate? And I think the concept has really spread. The PE response team consortium um, now is, is a number of years old now. Um, uh, it it's involves uh, hospitals around the country and now it's going international too. Even the uh, European Society of Cardiology guidelines suggested that PE response teams are a good idea. And one of the key reasons I think they are is because uh, our ED docs and our hospitalists and people in the hospital that see these cases initially, they have a lot to do and a lot to know. And there's a lot evolving in the PE space. So having uh, a phone call, for example, at Cedar sinai you call, uh, the ED can call three clot. It goes to the page operator. That goes to the pulmonary fellow who's on the PERT rotation on call, and sometimes directly to the physician, depending on the urgency. And we see the patient. We make decisions. Uh, we, if we need our interventionists involved, we call them. We may need to do a catheter-directed procedure or a systemic thrombolysis or a surgical procedure. Does the patient need the ICU? Are they really sick? Do they need ECMO? So these multidisciplinary teams get together and make decisions. I do think they're valuable. I think they really helped kind of unload the workload from uh, some of the other physicians. And you're also getting expertise from people who do this uh, do this uh, a lot. For example, through the pandemic, I was on call for the PERT team 24-7 for a year, maybe a year and a half. And uh, I think since this has been one of my um, big focus of my clinical medicine research for more than 20 years, 25 years, um, hopefully that's valuable to get expertise. Um, my colleagues at Cedars are, are superb. And so uh, this concept uh, should, should be done more and more at hospitals around the country, get multidisciplinary teams, address acute PE, and make good decisions. So yeah, for the long term, that, that's a great segue from the, from PERT and the in-hospital uh, um, uh, concept. Once people go home, uh, I, I believe they still need pulmonary embolism expertise. I don't think they should be shuttled off to their primary care doctor who have so much they need to know and, and there's so much evolving the PE space, new studies with anticoagulation, et cetera. How long do you treat? So I believe that... Uh, that uh, it could be a hematologist, it could be a pulmonologist, it could be a cardiologist, it could be a vascular medicine specialist. But in general, it should be someone who's a, a major focus of their clinical time is pulmonary embolism. And uh, I think maybe they're gonna see their primary care doctor um, you know, every three months or six months. And maybe after a visit or two to the PE specialist in the PE response team clinic or the PE clinic, uh, whatever you wanna call it, um, then maybe a yearly visit's enough. But you know, I want to make sure these patients long term are aware of any new research developments. Is there a new drug that they might be able to use to make their lives easier? Is there a drug that's safer, um, et cetera? We've already learned a lot uh, from, for example, the Einstein Choice Study and the Amplify Extend Study that these DOAC drugs, rivaroxaban and apixaban, uh, the dose can be dropped at six months. And some physicians aren't aware of that still. Drop a dose in half at six months. It's safer in terms of bleeding and still protective in terms of uh, recurrent DVT and PE. So again, the people that should follow PE patients long-term, and I should add, if these patients have persistent symptoms or recurrent symptoms, we think they might have CTEF or chronic PE or what some people call post-PE syndrome. They really need someone with expertise on sorting out the cause of their breathing. And often that's a pulmonologist. Uh, so sometimes it's a team effort in clinic. Uh, but someone with expertise needs to do this uh, for the long term. Well, good question. So I think uh, um, what we what we like to do is determine whether someone has risk factors for uh, DVT PE recurrence. And uh, sometimes what we do is we call these patients unprovoked or provoked. It's not a perfect way to describe this, but certainly if someone has persisting risk factors of um, morbid obesity um, uh, or significant prior venous thromboembolism, um, uh, mark markedly reduced mobility, um, certain thrombophilias, as we call them, uh, um, blood disorders that make them at risk, certain risk factors uh, would make us continue anticoagulation. Uh, by the same token, if you have no risk factors at all, 
and you still got VT, we call that unprovoked, that means you're really susceptible to, to DVT and PE. And it means you really need to stay on anticoagulation. So we do a risk benefit, look at the risk of recurrence, the risk of bleeding, and uh, anticoagulate everyone for at least three months, um, often, often that first, often six months. And then we make that decision, do we go on indefinitely or not? And that depends on these persistent risk factors or lack of them. Um, we see people that have what we call a minimally provoked P, what I call minimally pro provoked P. Maybe they're a healthy person. They flew from Paris to LAX and they got DVTP. I mean, millions of people do that all the time and don't get clots. So just sitting still on a plane for 10 hours or 15 hours, is that enough to make you at risk? Well, it worries me. And so we assess these patients carefully and decide we might continue them, even though it looks provoked, it's minimally provoked. We might continue them long-term. And again, we might use a lower dose anticoagulant, uh, rivaroxaban, uh, pixaban. Um, we might use a lower dose um, at the six month mark, again, to improve safety and still protect against clot. So we have good data for that now. Yeah, there are some interesting studies. Um, uh, there's a, a number of registries and clinical trials underway. And one of the interesting topics nowadays in PE is what do you do acutely? How do you decide if someone needs a, a therapy that's more aggressive than anticoagulation? We know anticoagulation is essential. We know that anticoagulation improves mortality. And we tend to see uh, big pulmonary embolism, massive PE, or we call high-risk PE. We know we've got to be aggressive with them. Either uh, catheter-directed therapy, or if necessary, thrombolytic therapy, sometimes surgical embolectomy. The bottom line is this is a hot topic now. How do you treat patients, risk stratify them? If they're intermediate high risk or intermediate risk, or if they're massive P high risk, do we need to do more? And many of us believe we should consider doing more. We don't have as many data as we'd like. So there's catheter-directed thrombolytic therapy uh, that's, that's uh, been studied. Um, we've got the uh, Ultima study, the Seattle 2 study, the Optilice PE study, where we've learned that we can improve uh, the right ventricular size and function by being a little more aggressive with catheter-directed therapy. And in these cases, it was ultrasound facilitated um, catheter-directed therapy. The ultrasound may help get the uh, thrombolytic agent to disperse into the clot better. Um, there's more work now in, in, in extracting clots or suctioning them out so we can avoid the risk of thrombolytics. I saw a patient recently had deep vein thrombosis underwent catheter-directed thrombolysis, and uh, because of the TPA he was given, he bled in his head and had a stroke. So we give thrombolytics sometimes if we need them, we got to be careful. But to get back to the question of what's new, um, for example, there's a big registry that's ongoing right now um, with acute PE. There's a big, uh, there's a big clinical trial called HiPytho comparing the ECOS device for catheter-directed thrombolysis versus anticoagulation alone in intermediate high-risk patients who are a little further enriched to make sure they're sick enough to be studied in a trial and that we can learn something from this. So that's a big worldwide trial. That's a big one. Um, the registry I mentioned, the FLASH registry, uh, uh, 230 patients were presented in the FLASH registry uh, uh, last year at the TCT meeting in AHA. Uh, this is a a study looking at the flow retriever device, uh, a clot extraction device. And these were mostly intermediate risk, some high risk patients. Um, in this 230 patients presented, uh, um, the mortality was 0%. Um, no uh, device related injuries or problems. Uh, major adverse events were very low. Major bleed risk, uh, uh, very low. Um, so this is one area um, um, looking at clot extraction. And to expand on that a bit, there's another big registry looking at massive PE with the flow retriever clot extraction device called FLAME. So we're going to learn a lot more. Uh, 500 patients from the flash registry we presented at TCT uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, at the uh, meeting in Florida, interventional meeting. So we'll know a little bit more about safety and efficacy of the flow retriever device. And finally, there's a big, the biggest news probably is the study called Peerless. And this is a randomized trial looking at the flow retriever clot extraction device versus catheter-directed thrombolysis. So instead of extracting the clot, you give some thrombolysis. So can we, can we improve on what we know now uh, when we do a catheter-directed procedure? And I think that's, those are some of the things to me that are new in 2021, 2022. And this concept of who you get aggressive with is an important idea now in, in PE. So uh, now 
Um, we've got good data now, like I mentioned, for rivaroxaban and apixaban for longer term therapy at low doses. Uh, one of the nice things about the Einstein choice study was that when patients were treated for at least six to 12 months, and then that they were randomized to either 20 milligrams of rivaroxaban, 10 milligrams, or, or an aspirin arm. And I think that was very helpful because what we learned was 10 and 20 milligrams was very protective after the six month mark, both the low dose and the, no the normal dose were. But the 10 milligram dose was very safe, um, low, low bleed risk. And as, in fact, the bleed risk was the same as the risk for aspirin, about 0.3 to 0.4% major bleed risk. So we learned that, uh, that this Zeralta rivaroxaban is not only, not only uh, effective at preventing recurrent VT at low doses, but it's as safe as aspirin. The major bleed risk was very low. And in fact, was more protective than aspirin. So, so the, the rivaroxaban dose did a better job at protecting from recurrences than aspirin. So, so we've got some good long-term data. We can drop the dose of these DOACs and, uh, and do a better job.